just lift your hands. Just, just in your own words, in your own way, just tell him, you're all I want. You're all we want, Jesus. And where that's not true in our lives, we face it and we own it. And we say, Lord, soften our hearts. Make our hearts hearts that long for you above everything else. Thinking of the psalm that says, as the deer pants for streams of water, let, Lord, my soul longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water, you are the living kind. You are the living water. Thank you, Jesus. You satisfy. Only you satisfy. And we receive that way down deep this morning and we make that confession that you're all you're everything Jesus you're everything you're everything you're all that matters so we align our lives our hearts our minds with that today Lord, it would be real religious of us to give you a space on a Sunday but not let you have the whole space throughout the week, every moment of our lives. And Lord, we don't want to be just Sunday people. We want to be kingdom people. We want to be lovers of Jesus above all else. Would you make it true of us by your grace? How many know grace is the power to become who he says you are? It's the power to do what he's called us to do. Grace, empowering grace. We received that this morning. Amen. Amen. Can you thank the team this morning? Thank you, guys. Always leading us with from your heart. You can have a seat. Uh, I'm hearing really good things about our communities this semester. Are you, are you having just a great time in your communities? If you're not in a community, it's not too late to sign up for one. You can go to the dwellingchurch.org and just find the, find the community button and find one and get in it. Get plugged in with people. Um, Look at me. I want you to hear my heart. This is great, right? Do you love this? What we do in the warehouse? Yeah. Leah loves it. How about, how about everybody else? <laughs> Don't you love this? This is a warehouse, but we're also a house church. In other words, we meet in homes throughout the week, and there's a place for you to get connected and grow. I'll just tell you this. If this is all you know of church, you're getting just a small percentage of what you need. Okay, It's like eating popcorn and that's all you eat. Like you need a full meal to grow and to mature. And so how does that happen? Well, you become in community. You become what God's called you to be in community. So thank you. And uh, also I got some good news. So sign up. Okay. Say, okay, Gunner. All right. So uh, I got some good news. We, you know, we started a food pantry to, to serve our community and love on our people and all that. And the Lord has blessed that. And as they have sought to just really resource people that come to the food pantry, the Lord's just been increasing that. And uh, we hit a, a new marker, a new goal, a new, um, uh, yeah, a new, a new marker yesterday. 51 families got loved on and um, provided for yesterday. And uh, when, you, when you give, and I don't, we never talk about giving, but I will talk about it in this context. When you give, it goes to feed people in this community who, and I'll just, I'll just, I, 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 I'll share this. Someone called the church number a few weeks ago and they said, I've been eating jelly for two days because it's all I have in my house. And I, I just want, I share that story to just let you know that 
what you're doing when you serve at food pantry and what you're doing when you give is you're providing for people, not just to, um, not just to get through the month, but now we're trying our best to just equip people to get above what's holding them down and to, um, to really live in freedom and, and fullness that, that God has for all of us. So I'm just so thankful for Chuck and Shay and how they lead that ministry. And for those of you that are um, partnering with that and serving in that capacity, that's great. Um, well, today uh, we're continuing our series, You Go Girl. Yeah. Has it been fun? Yeah. And uh, it's, been, it's just been so great to um, just dig into the Word and just see what God says about women, how Jesus uh, feels about women, and He empowers women, and he, um, that's what we do here too. And so this morning, you don't get to hear from me today, or maybe you don't have to hear from me today. Is that a better way to say it? But Sheree Jackson is going to be bringing the word today. Come on up, Sheree. Y'all make her feel welcome. But before, <laughs> before I give the mic over to her, I just want to share something real quick about Sheree and Daniel, and their two baby girls are here with us. Uh, Sheree and Daniel are old friends great friends, and uh, we met them several years ago, and they've just been such an encouragement to us. And as we were talking with the team earlier today, um, one of the things about Daniel and Sheree that they did for mine and Bethany's lives is they introduced us to a part of God that we had not yet experienced and didn't know. And much of what we're walking in as a family, a church family now, we really do owe it to you guys. And we're so thankful for you and your, your influence, not just on me and Bethany, but as a byproduct on everybody here and people who aren't here this morning watching online. So we're just so thankful um, for them and so honored that they would come here today and, uh, and share and just be here. These guys are church planters. Come on. We love church planting around here. And, uh, and so we're partnering with these guys as they plant Pioneers Church in Durham, North Carolina. And, um, and they are both preachers and they are both pastors. And uh, I was on my way here this morning about 6.30 and got stopped at a train crossing. And there was a car in front of me and I looked at the license plate and it said Judges 5 on the license plate. And I was like... Who has that on their license plate? And I look, of course, I pull out my Bible and I look it up and it's the song of Deborah. And I immediately thought of her because Sheree's just been a warrior, preacher, woman for Jesus ever since I've met her. And I know she's got a powerful word for us that's gonna touch us this morning. So let me pray for all of us, myself included and Sheree. And let's just, let's just prepare our hearts for the word. Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to say to us today. How are you going to rearrange and how are you going to change us? And we give you permission like you need it to begin with. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hey, guys. I'm so excited to be here. Gunnar tells that story of our, well, really was not a chance encounter, I think 11 years ago. Um, it was truly a divine appointment of our communities coming together. But here's the thing. When that happened, I was, I was 22 years old. So I'm 33 now. And I share that with you to say, when you're in the deep south and you have a 22-year-old little girl, it takes a really special pastor to hold room for that in his heart. And so... I, I'm so encouraged that this sermon series is happening. I think the timeliness of it is insane for what God is doing in the earth today. But I also want to name what you already know, that you've got the greatest pastors ever. <laughs> I mean, talk about, talk about holding room. Gunnar and Bethany held room for me when I was 22 years old in the deep South in a context where a mic probably should have maybe never been in my hand. And they saw past all of that context and held room for me, for little me. And I think that's really special and worth celebrating. So um, my name is 
Janice Shrey, Lopez Harding, Kensal Lynn, Day Jackson. You can call me Shrey for short. Now Shrey's not as hard, right? Shrey as in hooray with a shh in front of it. It's not Sherry. That's my mom's name. And it's not Ray. That's my dad's name. I'm their relationship name. <laughs> Reynaldo, my dad, means king in Spanish. And long before my parents were ever walking with the Lord, they named me She-King. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> God, I ask that you would make my tongue be like the pen of a ready writer, that I might write your heart to your people. Amen. I am in the stinky armpit of church planting. It is a joy and a wonder to behold. Um, it does not look like this right now. <laughs> and I am so encouraged. I'm so encouraged because this morning I was looking around just laughing. This is in Savannah as it is in heaven, is it not? Is it not? I remember coming with... Gunner and Bethany and the team are really early and coming to Savannah and praying and dreaming together with curiosity, God, what do you have? And I, I'm not here every day, so I get to come in and go, y'all, it happened, it happened. <laughs> Look at this room, look at this space. Even I've been studying um, beginning of Genesis and Rob confirmed this for me this morning when we were praying before we got started. Beginning of Genesis, um, there's this word brood. And it's the, the Holy Spirit brooding over the murky waters. And it's this moment right before creation breaks forth. Um, and I've been called to be a brooder, kind of like a hen. <laughs> and the other meaning of that word, just kind of like a <gasps> right before something happens. And, and as we were in worship this morning, I looked back and with the way that um, this is set up is like, it looked like you couldn't see the depth of the, the wall. And as I was looking, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm sitting in broody creation waters here in the dwelling. I'm sitting in this brooding place. And so I'm just so curious, what creative power is the Lord about to unleash on this city through you, through your faithfulness, through your obedience? So I had the joy of listening through the sermon series over the last couple of weeks and I'm so encouraged. It's been so good. And it, it truly is so important. It's so important. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for the work, um, the work that Pastor Gunnar and Pastor Bethany have done um, to open up this conversation about women. You go, girl. <laughs> to open up this conversation about women and, and how to hold room and hold a place for women. And today I'm gonna be looking at Mary Magdalene's story pretty closely. I'm not gonna be spending as much time on the question of like, should we? And I just ask that you would cover me in love and grace in this conversation because what I'm gonna be sharing is the, um, the why. Like, what are we missing out on if we don't allow women? Why me? Why this body? Why? Um, and I don't mean in a defensive way. I mean in an invitational way. So I just wanna name up front if you're in the room and this is a journey, and I think it's probably a journey for all of us, it certainly has been for me, cover me in grace. We're siblings in Christ. And I want you to know, if we hold different convictions on the place of women, the, the place of women in ministry, we're siblings in Christ. It's okay. It's okay. This is not essential for the practice of Christianity. This is truly a secondary issue. It's an important issue, but it is not in the forefront of what it means to love Jesus at all. And so I just wanna say some of the most important people in my life that I continue to learn from regularly do not affirm me as a lead pastor. I truly believe that God's called to unity. That's not uniformity of thought. That's we are siblings in Christ. Come hell or high water, even when it's hard, even when we disagree, even when there's tension, even when we can't see clearly, even when we're in different places. I, I 
believe that is the work that God has called us to do. So I just, I, I want to say, as I share, even, even being in this room, if hearing me right now is hard, thank you. Thank you for risking it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sitting with me in this sermon. And let's just cover each other in grace. Let's cover each other in love. So we ended last week with Pastor Gunnar talking about these um, boogers, these bo booger, booger passages in Timothy. And they are, they're such big, awful boogers. And I, I know that he meant like, you know, scary things, but I mean like literally the boogers in my nostril <laughs> right now. And I, I just, I want to piggyback on some of what he's um, shared. I, I thought that this unpacking of the word power and, and, and the, this unique word that Paul chooses to use about women wielding what I would call abusive power over men I thought that was so helpful. And I just want to say that I totally agree with Apostle Paul as he writes this. I also do not want or allow women in my church to wield abusive power over men or over our congregation. What we need to understand when we're looking at the context of Timothy is that Timothy is battling false teaching. There's the cult of Artemis that has risen up. And if you know the origin story of Artemis, the origin story is that she came first. Out of her, her brother Apollos came. And it was a, a cult situation where women wielded a, abusive feminist power. Yeah. And so I think, I think part of Paul's warning here is because he's, the whole letter is about false teaching. He's wrestling with false teaching and out of a deep love for the church, he sets up what I think is a really healthy boundary. Yeah. If I were to contextually work to honor Paul's words today, I might say something really hard. Like, I don't allow people who are obsessed with power to hold a mic in my congregation. And I don't allow people who refuse to do the work of education, to lead from power. Does that make sense? So women, women in this era didn't have opportunity to be highly educated, just the way that culture was set up. And if you know someone who has really missed out on the opportunity for education, sometimes there is a, a, a naivety and, and sometimes an ignorance that can come with that. Now, am I saying that only educated people should preach? No, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. God uses the most wild things to bring about his kingdom. But what I am saying is we have work to do. It is not enough for us to affirm what we affirm or believe what we believe with sentences like, because it's what the Bible says. Okay, I am pastoring in a post-Christian context. The people in my city who are far from God, and I'm guessing Savannah is right around the corner with this experience. If they have an exposure to Christianity, they've gone through massive deconstruction. That means that they're asking big questions. Why are systems in place? What about the patriarchy? Where has Christianity harmed and not helped? Yeah. Or they're de-churched, meaning like I, I never, I didn't grow up in faith. I didn't grow up in the church. And our platitudes are not enough. Yeah. We cannot say things like, because scripture says so, because the Bible says so. We have to be more wise and more careful and more diligent. And we are on a journey to understanding this holy thing, this holy text, a collection of stories, a collection, a library that has a full narrative arc from beginning to end. So as you can probably guess, I'm kind of a spooky, you know, weirdo Holy Spirit person. That's how I came to faith, which I'll share with you more in a bit. But God was inviting me towards something different. Mm -hmm. And so I left. I left my context. 
And I went and I earned my Master's of Divinity at Duke Divinity School. It was horrible. <laughs> but I believe that part of the call, part of the work towards meeting people where they are is to have a well-rounded relationship with Jesus. For whatever reason, <laughs> in our churches, and you've probably heard this said before, it's like the, the Bible and the Holy Spirit had a divorce. And some churches are Bible churches and some churches are Holy Spirit churches. God is calling us, those who are going into the labor fields, for the faithfulness of holding the baton to the next generation, Gen Zs and millennials, that we have to do the work of unifying the gifts of the Spirit, the movement of the Holy Spirit, and the wisdom of Scripture. We have work to do. All right, we're going to read a lot. We're starting at the top of John 20, taking a close look at Mary's story. Early on Sunday morning, it's the first day of the week, while it was still dark, while all was still lost, Mary Magdalene, this is the one who helped provide for Jesus. This is the one who was full of demons. This is the one known as a disciple. This is the one who was there at the beginning. This is the one who didn't leave Jesus when he was dying on the cross. This is the one who drew close outside the tomb when everyone else was gone. This Mary. Mary came to the tomb and she found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran while it was still dark. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body. They've taken it out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Peter, Peter and the other disciple, they started for the tomb. They were both running. They were running and the other disciple out around Peter and he reached the tomb first. He stooped in and he looked in and he saw, he saw the linen wrappings lying there and he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head, it was folded up and it was lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciples then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, the one whom Jesus loved, he went in, he looked around, he saw and he believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. And then they went home. But Mary was there. Mary was standing outside of the tomb she was crying with a broken heart. Where is his body? Where is his body? Where is his body? Where is my Lord's body? And as she wept, she stooped and she looked in. There, she saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. I don't know where they have put him. Mary isn't scared. She's not distracted by the terror of seeing angels. All she wants is Jesus. She turns to leave. And she sees someone standing there. It was, it was Jesus. She didn't recognize him. I imagine that her head was down, her face full of sorrow and full of tears and full of confusion. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, he's such a stinker. 
Who are you looking for, sweet girl, as my husband says to our little girls? She thought he was the gardener back in the garden. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and I will get him. Mary, Jesus said, I have called you by name. She turned to him and cried out, Ravoni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I've not yet ascended to my father, but go and, and find my brothers. I wonder what Jesus is telling the women to do here in this room. Go, Jesus says, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Not teacher. I have seen Messiah. I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we journey through today, and if you're taking notes, I want you to jot these down. I want you to ask yourself four questions. Why in the world is Mary's specific presence preserved in all four accounts of the resurrection story? Why Mary? What does Mary's perspective have to offer that could not have been carried out by John, by Peter, or by the other disciples? What is the narrative arc of Mary's story beginning to end? What do women uniquely have to offer in how they preach, teach, and lead? I love Mary's story because I see so much of my own story in Mary. I am the first person to love Jesus in my household. I came to know Jesus radically as a teenager, dark to light. And when I came to know Jesus, I knew nothing about the Lord beforehand. Like I remember being in school and someone saying, remember the reason for the season and me being like, what's the reason? And someone saying Jesus' birthday and me going, that stinks that he has to share his birthday with Christmas. Like I did not know anything about Jesus, but let me tell you what my natural response was to hearing the good news of Jesus. I went and I told every single person I knew about Jesus. I read the New Testament in about two weeks, cover to cover. And I went to my school. I prayed in my big public school in the mornings. I started fasting lunches. I started telling my friends about the Lord. I started inviting them to church. I went to a youth group that had about 400 kids in it. The first year, I, I, I was a, we had this big award show at the end of the year and I won Evangelist Hottie of the Year. <laughs> and I, I was so far, I, I was like, what, what is an evangelist? <laughs> like, I didn't know what, what that word meant. But I share this with you to say that <laughs> there, there just wasn't time to wonder. There wasn't, everyone needed to know about Jesus. Everyone needed to know about Jesus. I wanted my family to know about Jesus. My family was horribly broken. I, some of my earliest memories were my parents telling me that they're gonna get a divorce. I love you, mom and dad, if you're listening. Everyone had to know about Jesus. And that's what I did. And I don't hold myself responsible for what came next. I think God was doing a mighty work in me and in my family, and I got to play a part. But I remember um, some months later, I was sitting in a church service, and I think that the, the pastor's goal was to try to get dads to really step it up. And he was sharing about the likelihood of a household coming into faith 
um, if, you know, the, the, the dad came to faith, how likely it was that the rest of the household would follow suit. And he was going through the different members of the household and he said, now, if the youngest female in a family comes to faith, it's less than 4% chance that the rest of the household will come to faith. And me being the Puerto Rican I am said, challenge accepted. <laughs> I'm the youngest female. I have three older sisters. I'm the youngest female in my household. And I heard that and I thought, mm, it is an upside down kingdom, right? So in time, my very broken household, my parents separated when I was in fifth grade. I lived full time with my dad. My mom and my dad would come to faith within two months of each other in different cities. In time, I would baptize my dad. In time, I would officiate the wedding of my mom and my dad. Married to each other, household restoration. In time, my parents would sell their beautiful forever home in Florida after really beautiful, remarkable careers, they would sell everything and move to Durham, North Carolina to plant a church with me. <laughs> Jesus is too good. Something that you should know about me is that I love Jesus more than culture norms. I love Jesus more than anything. I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. And Jesus is too good to stay quiet. You know, I'm kind of, um, Gunner's words were so kind in showing me but I'm kind of like a um, bull in China shop type character, you know? I'm kind of a, a little bit like, it was entertaining. I, I entertained my husband at first and then I think like three years in, he was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what, <laughs> what did I do? No, he lo he's so faithful. Um, and I remember coming to faith and telling everyone that I knew about Jesus and then I got to college in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm just doing what I think God has called me to do. I'm leading the Alabama Campus Prayer Network. We have 12 universities, colleges, and HBCUs across the state that are networked in the place of prayer. I'm barely a student, not doing great in school, but traveling, seeing myself as a missionary on my college campus, and I'm going to these different campuses, and I'm sharing about who Jesus is, and then I have a friend who reaches out to me in love and says, Shrey, the Tuscaloosa chapter has to pull out. We can't be a part of the Alabama Campus Prayer Network. And I, I say, well, why? And he says, because you're leading it. I wonder, I wonder if Mary felt this way. I wonder if Mary... Here's Jesus and she knows that she's safe with Jesus and she knows that Jesus sees her and she knows that this is something worth proclaiming. But I wonder what she felt when Jesus said, go back and tell them. I love Jesus. And had the Lord told me that what I was doing was outside of his will, I'm being honest with you, I would have put it down. I did the work in study and scripture and conversation and talking after that friend came to me because I want to honor God with all of my days and all of my life. Why has Mary specifically been pre preserved in all four accounts of the resurrection? This is a good question. Because Mary is a woman, if you haven't noticed. And in this culture, the testimony of a woman is less than half as strong as the testimony of a man. 
this is a bad idea if you want everyone to believe that this story is true. Wow. It's a bad idea. <laughs> On paper, it's a bad idea for the youngest female in a family to come to know Jesus first. It's an upside down kingdom. <clears throat> Not only is she a woman, but she is a woman who was demonically oppressed by like more than one demon. It was really scary. Now I'm someone who suffers from clinical depression and I have for most of my life. And I don't really understand the contours of the ancient world and what we parse out as demonic oppression. And I don't know how much context there was for mental health, but even in our own context, sometimes those dynamics can overlap and overshadow. And I wonder if you have someone who's struggling in the way that Mary was struggling, and I mean really struggling, oppressed underneath the, the demonic lies of the enemy. Even though Mary was set free, and we know that she was set free because of how her life follows suit. You don't give up everything and follow someone for the next three years and weep outside of his tomb and not be afraid of angels unless you've been radically touched by God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would wager to say that the community had not caught up. What is remembered of Mary, and I'm sure there were plenty who knew that a miraculous work had happened, and I'm sure there were plenty that remembered who she was. Oh, Mary? Mm. Mary is the one who said Jesus was alive? Like, the guy that we all clearly saw die on the cross. You guys remember that Mary kind of struggles with reality? This is a bad idea. We don't know if Mary was single, but we can guess that she was because her husband's never talked about. We know that Jesus was single. Mary and Jesus alone? In this context, in this culture, you're gonna trust the story of the resurrection to a single woman who has an issue with reality? This is a bad idea. So if it's such a bad idea, why do they do it? <laughs> if it's such a dangerous idea to allow women to carry the gospel, why does Jesus do it? And we need to pick bones with Jesus because Jesus is the one that does it. Jesus is the one that says, go and tell my brothers that I'm ascending to heaven. Why? It seems like too big of a risk. What does Mary's interpretation of events, her perspective of events have to offer that could not have been carried by John. It couldn't have been carried by Peter. It couldn't have been carried by the other disciples. Mary is a woman. Do you know what women do? When, when, when all is in crisis, women get in the mess. Women are healers. When you've won the loyalty of a woman, it is unshakable. Yeah. It is unquenchable. The other disciples have left. Some are even on the road to Emmaus. Some are on the way away. There's pride and struggle. And I, I'm painting with a broad stroke, okay? I fulfill many gender stereotypes that are not normal. And yet, I am a woman and I am a healer. And when I preach, when I share, you hear the mother heart of God. See, Mary responds differently than the other disciples. She is marked with grief and with tears. She and the other women never leave. They never turn their head. They never look away. They never walk away from the cross. They watch him die. And they still don't leave. They still get the incense and the spices and the oil and they wanna do right by his body. They do not leave. They keep showing up. And even when the disciples leave again, she stays outside of the tomb. She keeps crying, she keeps weeping. 
Women have this insane strength. That's why we give birth to babies. We're not afraid of angels. Think about it. Most of every single account of angels showing up in scripture is met with men falling on their face in terror. (laughs) And Mary does not fall on her face in terror. In fact, she seems a little annoyed and distracted. (laughs) All right, angels from God, where's Jesus? (laughs) Where's Jesus? She has a tender heart. She has a weeping heart. So what's the the narrative arc of, of Mary's story? Just let me be a spooky Holy Spirit person for a second. I'm just speculating. I think Mary is a seer. I think that at the beginning of her story when she was demonically oppressed, I think that opened up something in the spirit realm and this thing that terrorized her, that paralyzed her, that destroyed her life would become the thing that was a gift in her that was uniquely needed for the moment. Because here's the thing, the boys walk into the tomb, do they just not see the angel? Does the angel appear out of nowhere? Was the angel there? Were the angels there? And did the guys not have the eyes to see what the Lord was up to? Her name is literally Mary. Now there's a lot of Marys in the New Testament. But does this remind you of anybody else? Another Mary who was alone? Another Mary who heard the word of angels? Another Mary who was put in an impossible situation to carry the gospel? Another Mary who was faithful when no one else was. Here's the thing, Mother Mary's heart As we know, any chosen fans in the house, Mother Mary's heart leads Jesus to the first miracle. Mama, it's not my time yet. Mom, please. (laughs) And Jesus turns the water into wine. I wonder if Mary was crying in that tomb and Jesus' heart (laughs) just couldn't stop. Mary, it's not my time yet. Don't touch me. Don't cling to me. I'm having to send it to the Father. This is a little disruptive. This is not our order of operations. This reminds me of mom, women. (laughs) But this is why you need women in your leadership because we tug on Father's heart in a really special way. Let me tell you, I believe that when I wept over my family, that Jesus' heart was moved. I just think that Jesus has a tender place for women. What do women uniquely have to offer in how they preach and teach and lead? (laughs) I remember going to the premiere of Wakanda in downtown Durham, and I was in a sea of African-Americans and... um, it had been out for a couple of weeks and one of the guys, it was, you could just feel the energy in the room and one of the guys said, oh, we're, we're, breaking all, we're breaking all of the box office expectations. Keep coming back. See it a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. And the African-American community was just alive and buzzing. But what I loved about what he said was he said, we. <laughs> like he didn't make the film. Like he wasn't receiving the profits from the film. But what I guess is that when he saw Wakanda, he saw himself in that story. And I've seen this happen again and again. Um, When Crazy Rich Asians came out, one of my best friends is from Singapore. And I asked her how she liked the movie and she said, no one I know in Singapore is that rich. But it was, my heart just melted seeing that food scene (laughs) when they go and eat. She's like, that is actually exactly what it's like when I go home, I just eat and eat, and it's so wonderful. And I remember sitting in the theaters, watching In the Heights as a Puerto Rican, and just 
tears rushing down my face, watching the story of my family unfold before my eyes. This is what happens when people in my body come in this place. There are many who are not seen. Every single time I preach, a young woman comes up to me and says, I heard the gospel in a way that I've never heard before. And it's because it came through this body. Representation really matters. So why Mary? Why Sheree? Why women? I wanna offer you this church, that when you make room for women, you get access to a special part of God's heart, that something opens up. I do not lead as a man. I even struggle with these terms, complementary and egalitarian. Because do I believe that God has made a way for women to speak in every single capacity? Yes, I do. And part of the reason that God has made that way is because the way that I lead is distinct and different from the way that my wonderful husband leads. The way that I carry God's nurturing, compassionate heart, the way that I as a woman have access to my emotions matters. And it does not just unlock something for women in the room. It unlocks something for men. Are we not the household of God? Jesus doesn't say, go and tell my disciples. He says, go and tell my brothers. My brothers, sisters, siblinghood, household language. Why? Because a healthy household, a healthy household honors mom and dad. A healthy household sees siblings as the first social relationship that you have. Mary is alone with Jesus because there's nothing to risk. Mary is secure with Jesus. That's her brother. Let us be the household of God and bring healing to the nations. Let us have women in power and strength and humility and tenderness and compassion in the unique ways in which women are oriented towards God. Release the kingdom of God here on earth. My friends, the harvest is so full. I know because I'm a church planter. The harvest is so full. It's so full and the labors are so few. Please pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth the harbors, the, the labors into the harvest fields. We pray with me. God, for the women in the room, I ask God that you would make our hearts be like Mary. Mary who chases after you. Mary who doesn't let the norms of social decorum stop us from seeing Jesus. Mary who sits at your feet. Mary who gets up and goes and says, he is risen, he is risen indeed, he is alive. Mary, apostle to apostles. Mary, first preacher of the gospel. Mary, who weeps. Mary, who moves Jesus' heart to reveal who he is even before he's ascended to the Father. God, I ask for brothers in the room. that there would be an opening, a, a space made, room held for the ways in which women reveal and carry aspects of the Father's heart that is needed for the building up of the household of God. I, 
I just even see that there's some of you who words were spoken over you. And maybe they were meant in love, like they were not meant to hurt, but they have been like arrows, daggers in the hands of the enemy, the father of lies. that have come and hit and penetrated. That has said, get in your place, be silent, be quiet. You're gonna cause more harm than good. You're too much. I wonder how often Mary thought she was too much. I wonder how often Mary thought it was too much to be crying at that tomb. I wonder how exhausted Mary was that morning after two days of wondering where he was. I wonder if God's word is that we are not too much, that we are the right thing at the right time in the right place. Woman, be who you are called to be. Dear woman, dear woman, be who you are called to be. God, release strength in this room. Release courage in this room. And if there are any women who have known that God has called, I would really like to pray for you. 